In the 1930s, black hole research was very primitive and there was still a lot to learn. Einstein himself argued that black holes couldn't exist in the real universe and even said that it just doesn't smell right. But with the advent of World War II, physicists quickly shifted their priorities from theoretical physics to nuclear physics as they tried to develop the almighty nuclear bomb. After the war, theoretical physics research had resumed and most of the prominent physicists who had worked on developing the atomic bomb had shifted their focus on the research of black holes again, even though many of the physicists in the US and the Soviet Union were still working on developing the most powerful nukes during the Cold War, of which could have actually indirectly expedited the process of humanity locating the black hole with high certainty, but we'll get back to that. So the search for our first black hole in the night sky began in 1964 by Yakov B. Zeldovich. While most physicists were trying to figure out what happens inside a black hole, Zeldovich put his efforts into discovering what happens near and around a black hole with the intention to locate a black hole in the night sky, something not many people were doing at the time. There were primarily four methods that were thought of, and in this video, we'll be going through these four ideas until we eventually reach the idea which led to the first successful black hole discovery named Cygnus X1. Imagine looking up at the night sky, thinking how are you going to be able to find a black hole? You can first start by thinking about how far the nearest black hole can be. Could there be a black hole in our solar system? Definitely not. Any black hole in our solar system would disrupt the orbits of every single object dramatically, so we would have noticed it by now. So we need to look further, but how much further? We know that black holes are just made from massive stars once they run out of fuel, so perhaps a black hole can reside at least the distance of the nearest gigantic star relative to our solar system, which would be Sirius A, which on a side note is actually the brightest star in our night sky. So at the distance of around 8 light years, we can calculate that if a star of the mass of Sirius A were to implode into a black hole, it would go from having a diameter of 2.4 million kilometers to just 12 kilometers. So now we get into our first method of finding a black hole. Why can't we just simply look at one through our telescopes? We know that a black hole bends light around it, so if we just zoom in enough we can see it. Better yet, if a black hole has an accretion disk, we can just look at the light emitted to easily pinpoint exactly in the night sky where the black hole is. Well, I hate to burst your bubble, but absolutely none of that would work. You've got to understand how small black holes are in order to realize how hard it is to actually see them. Going back to Sirius A, if a star of that mass imploded into a black hole at a distance of around 8 light years, that would be equivalent to me trying to look at one single human hair on the surface of Jupiter from my backyard. So we're going to need another way. We know that black holes can bend light, so maybe if there is a black hole in between Earth and a star, it can converge the star's light into a single point acting like a lens, which could increase the star's brightness by 10 to 100 times, because there's literally more photons reaching our eyes. This technique is called microlensing. However, this precise alignment between a teeny tiny black hole and an interstellar star to converge light rays precisely at the location of Earth is insanely rare, basically impossible, or so we thought at the time. So we're off to a slow start, I know, but we're going to start getting places very soon. The next method was proposed by Zeldovich himself which involved carefully observing the movements of binary star systems. A binary star system is when there are two stars at each orbit around each other, and these two stars can be a mix between massive stars and small stars, a star in a black hole, a star in a neutron star, 
even two black holes or two neutron stars would be considered a binary system. But what Zeldovich wanted to focus on were the binary systems where only one star was visible, but we can clearly observe that it was orbiting an unseen star. What he wanted to do was measure the speed of the star as it orbits the mystery star. And based on the velocity of the star that we observe, Zeldovich proposed that we can measure the mass of the unknown object, and if the mass was great enough, in particular if the mass was more than two solar masses, with one solar mass being equal to our sun's mass, then we know that the star's companion is indeed a black hole. So just to recap, the larger the mass of the mystery object, the faster the velocity of the orbiting star because of the increased pull towards the center. We can measure the star's precise velocity relative to us using a technique called spectroscopy. So I'll explain this pretty quickly, but essentially if an object is moving toward us, we can say that that light is blue shifted, and if an object is moving away from us, that light is red shifted. So basically a spectral graph can display the light spectrum of an object and we can see if the light of an object is red shifted, blue shifted, or even stationary relative to us. And this method can compute velocity with an air tolerance of only 100 meters per second, even for stars thousands of light years away, which is pretty insane. So by accurately measuring the velocity of the star, we can obtain the precise mass of the mystery object, and if that mass is above three solar masses, then we know for a fact that it's a black hole. There's no way this could fail. Well, actually you're wrong. We're getting closer, but there's still a couple reasons why this wouldn't work. First off, the results of the velocity that we can get from the star can be pretty inaccurate. Even though a spectral graph can detect speeds with an air tolerance of only 100 meters per second, its accuracy is limited by the fact that the velocity we measure is the velocity of the object in a direction directly towards us. We can try to carefully observe and factor in the inclination of the orbit, but it's likely that it's still not going to be that accurate. So if the velocity is inaccurate, we can't correctly calculate the mass of the unknown object. The other issue with this method is that let's say we perfectly measure the object's velocity after taking in its inclination and everything else. We know that the velocity is correct and based on these calculations, physicists determine that the mass of the unknown object is let's say 4 solar masses, well above the mass needed for the hidden companion to be a black hole. Well not so fast. The hidden object has a mass that's well above the mass needed for it to be a black hole, but we still can't be sure that the companion is a black hole. Why? Because there could be, for example, two neutron stars, each with a mass of two solar masses that orbit each other in their own binary system at the center. You could even have four super dim white dwarf stars, each weighing in at one solar mass that all orbit each other in the center. The point is that even if we knew precisely the mass of what was in the center, we still can't be sure that it's a black hole. We need more information. The next method was a bit of a game changer and was discovered simultaneously by Zeldovich and Cornell astrophysicist Edwin Salpeter, and it goes like this. If a black hole travels past a massive cloud of gas just floating around in space, all of that gas would feel the intense gravitational pull. The mechanism that these physicists theorized that they can use to detect a black hole was that if the gas was far away enough from the black hole to not get pulled in, the gas can start orbiting the black hole and quickly accelerating and colliding with other gas that's orbiting the black hole. And these insanely powerful collisions between the gas particles creates tons of friction, which then turns into heat. And in this case, the heat is so strong that it radiates not into visible light, like you would see for example in an incandescent light bulb, but it instead radiates in a spectrum even more energetic than visible light. It would radiate in x-rays. This idea was kind of put on hold just because Zeldovich and his team were pretty busy studying a bunch of other things. But after two years, Zeldovich and his fellow physicists Igor D. Novikov realized that if they combined their black hole idea with the binary star idea, they might be able to finally find a black hole. So just to recap, 
we need massive clouds of gas to pass by a black hole in order for us to be able to see the x-rays. But if a black hole is orbiting a star like in a binary system, where would the black hole get these gases from? Well, some stars emit strong gases such as hydrogen or helium, and these are called solar winds. When a star emits a solar wind, the black hole's gravity pulls the gas towards it and creates the same mechanism that Zeldovich and Salpeter had proposed two years prior. So the theory is correct, but the thing is that in the early 1960s, X-ray telescopes were pretty primitive and we needed pretty powerful X-ray telescopes to see the gas collide around the black hole. In 1961, the Soviet Union tested the world's most powerful nuclear bomb ever detonated, the Tsar Bomba. Zeldovich was one of the lead physicists behind the project and it totally caught the US by surprise. So naturally, the US Air Force organized a crash program led by Richard Gaikoni, a 28-year-old experimental physicist, to help them detect nuclear bomb explosions from outer space. And one of the main things that these satellites were looking for were X-ray emissions from the explosions. This advanced X-ray detection capabilities so much that after two years of successfully testing X-ray detecting satellites that were aimed at Earth, Gaikoni's team was finally ready to aim at the stars. Actually, first they aimed it at the moon. Physicists at the time believed that the planets and the moons in our solar system would emit most of the X-rays that we observe. So the first thing Gaikoni and his team did were aim their detector at the moon. After the observation, the team noticed an incredible amount of x-rays being emitted, 5,000 times more than anyone expected. But upon closer inspection, they realized that these x-rays weren't being emitted by the moon, but instead from the nearby constellation Scorpius in the night sky. So this was the first time humanity had observed what we now call an x-ray star orbiting in a binary star system, and we called this particular star Scorpius X1. After closely measuring and determining the mass of the X-ray star, physicists determined that the mass of the hidden star was only 1.4 solar masses, which meant that it was a neutron star, not a black hole. But soon enough in 1964, astronomers discovered another X-ray star in a binary system located in the constellation Cygnus. And for years, Hundreds of physicists and astronomers put a bunch of efforts into determining if what we were actually detecting was really a black hole. And today, we now know that the X-ray star we were looking at was named Cygnus X1 and is indeed a black hole with an estimated mass of a whopping 21 solar masses, making it the first ever black hole located with near certainty by humanity.